Suspense. Radio's outstanding theater of thrills brings you an hour, a full 60 minutes of Suspense. Howard Culver stars as Sid in The Search. This hour-long suspense episode is missing its first 15 minutes, but I'll tell you how the broadcast begins so you can enjoy it to its fullest. I'm classic radio collector and broadcaster Bob Lines, and I'm very pleased to play a part in the preservation of the suspense radio series and its history. An hour-long suspense episode had four transcription discs, large 16-inch records, to be complete. The first disc of the search has never been found. It was likely broken and unplayable. Luckily, the original script of this episode survived. It's in the KNX collection of radio scripts, now archived at the University of California at Santa Barbara. Now we finally understand how the story begins. It's clear that The Search, written by Grace Amundsen, is one of the better hour-long suspense programs. The story is set in the Dakotas near the Montana border. There are four primary characters. Sid Latch, played by Howard Culver, Roger Miles, portrayed by Barry Kroger, Iris Johnson, played by Sandra Gare, and Sid's dog, Bo, portrayed by animal imitator Pinto Kolvig. This is how the episode begins. Sid Latch owns a herd of sheep. He's raising them and plans to sell them at market. Sid and his dog Bo have been drifting for quite a long time. After all these years, Sid would like to be settled. He wants to better establish himself by using the money from the sale of the sheep to purchase land of his own. A severe blizzard with very high winds is coming across the plains. Sid is worried for the safety of the lambs and how they will survive the night in the snow and the cold. He will wait out the storm with Bo in the safety of his chuck wagon. This simple wagon is where he lives. Sid and Bo hear a car approach. An unknown man, whom we learn is Roger Miles, gets out of the car and calls out. He can barely see Sid in the wagon through the falling snow. Sid tells Roger that his car is stuck because the snow is too high. He tells him to lock the car and to wait out the bad weather. Miles admits he's a little drunk, but he will wait it out in the chuck wagon with Sid and the dog. Sid learns that Miles is a Western movie star. Sid soon realizes that there is someone else in the car, a woman named Iris Johnson. He goes to her, but she says she'd rather stay inside the car because Miles can be difficult when he's drunk. She feels safer there, away from him. Sid explains it's not safe to stay in the car in the severe weather. He assures her she will be fine because he and Bo will look after everyone who stays in the wagon. Iris warns Sid about Miles, saying that he is taking in a drunk and a fool. Iris ran away with Miles from her home in Wallace, South Dakota. She explains that a handsome movie actor whispered in her ear. Once away with him, she realized she made a bad decision. Miles later admits that he doesn't even know Iris's name. Iris says she wants to go home, and Miles says, It's not that easy. It's clear that Iris is trapped and fearful of him. Miles brags about how easy it is for him to pick up young girl fans and boasts about how many people attend his public appearances. The more Miles drinks, the more belligerent he gets. He asks for dinner. All Sid can offer is fried bread. Then Miles starts getting nasty. He hears the bleats of the lambs in the distance. He insults Sid by saying that cowboys hate sheep herders because the sheep eat away good grassland. Sid asks if Miles is a cowboy, and he says, I am a cowboy. 
That means that Miles has a deep resentment for Sid, someone he just met, and despite Sid's generous providing of shelter. He continues to insult Sid by saying Sid doesn't know who Miles is because he doesn't go out to the movies. Miles accuses Sid of staying cut off from the modern world. Sid says that the world seems to go along fine without him. This is where the surviving recording of The Search picks up. The drunken Miles is antagonizing Sid and Iris with nasty words and belittling banter. Miles starts bragging about how much money his notoriety raised for sale of war bonds during World War II. Let's start listening. You know what I did in the war? Oh, there was a war, don't you? I sold two million dollars worth of bonds. Me and my horse, pistol. Horse pistol. <laughs> oh, how I hate that animal. Tell me what you do in a war. It's been a long time. I forget. You forget? I'm stuck here with a moron on the one hand and a round dream on the other. Look at her. She's going to cry again. Stop it. Stop it and leave me alone. Relax, Romeo. That's about enough. <laughs> Is it, boy? Is it now? All right, Bo. Come on. Over here. What you doing? I'm feeding my dog. For the rest of us eat? That's right. You see, this dog works. Well, I don't know about that, but he's not going to eat. Why, you... Oh, you're going to have to eat your dinner up off the floor. But first, come on and take a walk with me. If I don't get outside fast, I'm going to kill a man. I apologize, boy. I apologize for the whole human race. <laughs> I stood for a moment in the middle of the swirling darkness in the storm. Only a few hours before, this had been my home, mine alone, free from the bicker and world and the men who made it. Now the storm had brought me these two, and in a blind moment, a hot, boiling anger. I knew that I'd almost taken a man's life. I felt the cold on my face, clearing my head and calming me. The storm would go. By morning, if I were lucky, they'd be gone too. I could be alone again. Alone the way I wanted to be. Well, then I walked through the flock with Bo at my heels, shaking some strays out from the false comfort of the drifts, then I went back into the wagon. The wagon had grown cold. The radio had been turned on and was operating faintly. And Iris was still crouched behind the stove. I stooped over the lambs to settle them for the night. And I groped around for the old quilt I'd put over them. He took it. What? The quilt. He took it to wrap up in. Oh, he did, did he? Please take my coat here. Wrap him in this. He's finally gone to sleep. Now, don't start a quarrel. Now he's drunk. This quilt was meant for lambs. Hey, well, what you doing? <laughs> Give me that quilt. Hey, get that dog out. If she shakes up any snow in my guitar, I'll kill that mangy hound. You mongrel, get away from that guitar. All right. You break my guitar, will you? I'll kill that dog now. Put down that bottle. Get out of my way. Stupid hound. We'll have his hide. Put down that bottle. And... Let go of me. Let go. Let go. Oh. Is he dead? From what? We were just mauling each other. I didn't even hit him. He had his head on the stove. Oh, he's dead, I know it. He's dead. Hey, wait a minute. Roger Miles, the celebrated cowboy star. 
insisted on driving on to fulfill a personal appearance through the most severe blizzard witnessed around these parts in many years. Billings, Montana, has reported no word on Miles yet. For the benefit of thousands of his fans throughout the country, we can only pray... Turn that off that radio. Comes through I won't listen to his state. heart. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. He is. I can't look at him. Throw something over him. All right, all right. Now hold on to yourself. They'll say we killed him. They'll be looking for us, don't you see? The whole world will be looking now for us. Now listen to me. And listen carefully. Just keep looking at him and get used to it. Because he's our baby and we're going to sit right here with him till morning. Now tomorrow we'll decide what we're going to do. Oh, what can we do? All we have to remember is to tell him just what happened. That's the only way we stand a chance. But we don't. We don't stand a chance at all. of Roger Miles. The militia was ordered out as soon as the snow plows were underway. Meanwhile, worshippers gathered quietly in churches this morning throughout America to pray for the safety of the idol of millions. In Hollywood, Mrs. Miles emphasized that her husband had always been a sportsman and that she prayed he would not lose his battle with nature. There were are, also indications coming in. From are Hollywood you awake? And very yeah. I've been awake all night. Were you able to sleep? No. They'll never stop till they find him. It'll get bigger all the time. They'll be covering the countryside. Now it's going to be all right, Iris. Is it? Now, look. We're going into the sheriff at Sheridan together. We'll tell him the same story. The flock won't drift too far. I can get back by tonight. Oh, it's no good. They'll pick us up long before we get there. Don't you see we're as good as caught? We can't be, that's all. We can't let them find us. Once they do, we lost the advantage. What are we going to do? I got the car clear and put on chains. Now, I can't locate the drifts toward Pierre, but I think I can figure out where the crests are and ride between them going west. Don't matter where we give ourselves up, as long as we do it first. Listen, Listen they're still talking about it. The press agent this morning that the cowboy may have been the victim of foul play. He is known to have carried large sums of money on his person for his own spontaneous charities. Local authorities everywhere are requested to watch out for a blue convertible car with a California license plate. Turn it off. I went through his pockets. He wasn't carrying any money. I know. Oh, you should have seen how he spent it when he was drunk. It's time we were going. All right. Uh, you better take that fur robe oh. off him. You'll need it. Oh, no. no, I can't. He's dead, Iris. Dead as a doornail, and I, I personally don't care. I didn't expect to see you get sentimental about it. Oh, I can't touch it. All right, all right, I'll get it. I better take my roll, too. Is that where you keep your money? I'd keep mine in a bank if I had that much. Closest bank is 20 miles. This old sock does just as well. Now, come on, Bo. Oh, are we taking the dog, too? I always take the dog. Oh, but there's no road. It's all covered in the snow. I'll find it. I know this neighborhood. Wait. Wait, I just remembered. The description of the car, they'll recognize us. Oh, no, they won't. I've covered the license plates with axle grease, and the car's covered with ice. Now, you better cover up with this. Right. Hibbo, get in there. In the back with you. Come on. Come on. Ah. Now, here we go. It'll all be over in a few hours. By tonight, we'll both be able to forget we ever saw Mr. Roger Miles. By tonight, Iris, we'll be safe. Tired? No. I'm just afraid. You don't have to be. We'll be in Sheridan in a few minutes, and then it'll be all right. After all, it, it was self-defense, wasn't it? What else could they prove against us? That's right. That's exactly what it was. So you can relax. Oh, yes. 
Yeah, I can. We both can. You know something funny? Right now, I don't know anything close to funny. Us two together like this. And the night we spent back there. What I mean is, I've only known your day and... Still, I feel so easy with you that we might have known each other all our lives. Yeah. We had quite a night together. I never want to see another one like it. And you know something else? I don't even know your name. It's an easy one to remember. Sid Latch. Sid Latch. Yeah. I'll remember it. How'd you happen to get tied in with a man like that? I've been asking myself the same question. You're not the type, Iris. Doesn't make sense. He promised to marry me. And you went for it, knowing he had a wife already? I went for it. He had money and he was famous and he could take me away from Wallace. I felt as though I were being rescued from a grave. So I was willing to take the chance. It doesn't make me sound like a very nice person. I suppose I'm not. Well, you're just a young kid. I guess you're allowed a mistake or two when you're young. You're young, too, Sid. Yeah. My mistake was taking him in. But then if I hadn't, I I wouldn't have met you. So, you see, it all has a way of sort of working out. Thanks, Sid. Well, we're coming into a town. Oh, would this be Sheridan? Yeah, this is it. Now, I'll park the car a minute and go to that dive and get us something to eat. It's a sense the sheriff won't be serving us tea. I want to come too, Sid. Don't leave me alone. All right, all right. Come along. <laughs> now, now, Bo, you stay here. We'll be right back, Bo. You got all your men together, Al? How about 30 of them? That should be enough. Uh, 30, huh? Yeah, that's a good search party. I expect we'll find him before night. Well, if you can't, Al, he's not going to be fine, that's all. Hey, how about some service, mister? A huh? couple of hamburgers to start with. Uh, hold on, young fella. I got a rush order here for 30 hot chocolates and 60 ham sandwiches. These men hunting for Roger Miles got to be fed. Hey, um, hey, tell me, Al, uh, where are you going to search? Well, I've been thinking of heading out toward Buffalo. Mm-hmm. I got a hunch he might have got stuck on that road coming up from Clear Creek. That's an idea. Hey, hey mister. Yeah? You're just driving from the south? That's right. See anything of a blue convertible California license? I wasn't looking. You wasn't looking? You got an echo in here, friend. What kind of a guy are you, anyway? Guy who minds his own business. This happens to be everybody's business. Do you know what's been going on around here? No, but I got an idea you're about to tell me. Now, look, pal, I... Oh, here comes the new bus for Billy, Nick. Yeah, I see it, I see it. You'll really be busy when they come piling in here. Nah, that bus only stops to pick up passengers. Hey, there's a bulletin on the radio. Well, turn it up. Turn up that radio. And we'll repeat that bulletin from the state police. At 10 a.m. today, a county plow from Gillette came across the body of Roger Miles in an abandoned sheep wagon on a branch of the Powder River. Police say there are indications Miles fought desperately for his life and revealed his assailants escaped west in Miles' car. Carlton Sturgis, a local rancher, says that a young veteran by the name of Sid Latch has been running sheep in that vicinity. Latch, Sturgis said, has a Montana sheepdog called Bo. Hey, how about some service here? Do I have to wait all day for a couple of your lousy sandwiches? Quiet down there. My eye. I want to eat, and I want to eat now. Be quiet. One more peep out of you, and I'll wrap your skull with this bottle. And so the manhunt begins. The dragnet is out. A dog called Bo, a girl named Iris, and a man known as Sid Latch. The only thing the police can be sure of is a dog called Bo who will respond quickly to his name. Remember that, ladies and gentlemen, a blue convertible and a black and white dog called Bo. The whole nation awaits the apprehension of these criminals. We now return you to Joe Franklin at the Orchard. Ow. What's up? Bob just pushed some ice off that car outside, and it's blue. Blue? And I wiped the license clean, and it's California. There's nobody inside. Only a black and white dog. Well, that's it. That's what we're looking for. Come on, Nick. You want to be in on the kill? Yeah, I want to be in on that reward, too. Oh, we're finished, Sid. They've got us. Now, listen to me. Whatever happens, stick at my side. And don't run. Don't give it away by running. What are you planning? That bus outside is about to go. We're going to try to make it. Oh, Sid. Sid, I'm too scared to move. Move, baby. Now. Sure's name's Bull. When I called him? Okay, we'll wait for him here. Well, they're not going to skip town without a car. You just made it, folks. Yeah. 
Why do people always wait till the last minute? Got your tickets? We didn't have time. Uh, two to Billings. Take it out of this tan. Now, the company doesn't put up ticket offices just for scenery. All right, here's your change. Why, the crowd around that car back there wonder what it was. Oh, just a dog. Probably threw a fit. Dogs do anything for attention. Sid. Yeah? Will we go to the sheriff in Billings? That's right. I saw a mob after a man once. They seemed crazy. Wild crazy. They didn't give him a chance to talk to anyone. They killed him the minute they caught him. They took a rope and threw it over a tree and then... Stop it! Stop it. What are you talking like that for? Now that Bo is with us, Sid, we won't be so easy to catch. Maybe we shouldn't give ourselves up. Maybe they won't give us a chance. Maybe we just should run away, Sid, together. No. Is it because you don't want to be with me? You see, I'd been hoping that maybe you and I... Well, it's not that, Iris. It's just that we're not going to run away. That'd be wrong. Now, we'll wait in Billings till the police snap out of this stampede. Then when they catch their breath, they'll know we didn't kill that that prize bull because we didn't have a motive. All right. I'm sorry about Bo, Sid. Yeah. I wouldn't worry, though. You'll be able to go back and find him when this is over. Well, I won't have to do that. He'll find me. He's done it before. Sid. What? I've decided I won't be afraid anymore. Not as long as I'm with you. <laughs> Billing Special stopped at the bus station north of the tracks. We got off and stretched our legs. It was already dusk and a cold wind was beginning to blow again. Iris was pale and drawn and, well, I was pretty tired myself. It was high time we had a full night's sleep. Tomorrow morning would be soon enough for me to nose around and find out the temper of the town and, well, if all was well, hunt down the sheriff. But tonight, what each of us wanted most was sleep. So I picked a small motel at the edge of town, off the heavy traffic of the main streets. A great big fat man got out of his chair in the office and pushed the register toward me. While I began to sign it, he began to ask questions. Been uh, on the road long? Maybe we have. Think you uh, might stay a few days? I think we might. Come from uh, Sheridan Way? What if we have? You don't talk a lot, do you? No. People seem to do my talking for me. This little woman is your wife, eh? You ought to know quite a lot. There's nothing personal. I just got to have it on the register. Oh, yeah, I forgot. It's all right. I'll fix it. Bill Wolf, huh? That's what it says. Phil Wolf. Okay, I'll just add, uh, and wife here. Thanks. First one over here. Just a few steps. All right. Come on, honey. Nice room. Sure you'll find it, homie. Got two hot plates in it so you can do all the cooking you like. Oh, that'll be fine. Here we are. Uh-oh. Wait a minute. This, is, this one won't do. <laughs> you don't want twin beds, do you? Oh, twin beds is just fine. Yeah, yeah, we'll take it. Or whatever you say. You notice you got a radio, too. There's one in every room. We like our guests to be at home. You just turn it on whenever you like. No extra charge. Here. Uh, well, we're a little tired, so if you don't uh, mind... Just a minute. Ought to be time for that news broadcast. Different phases. And Dr. Frederick Chess warned that this is merely the beginning of such lawless terrorism on the part of young maladjusted criminals. Iris Johnson, Dr. Chess says, was assigned the role of luring Miles to latch his lonely wagon on the pretext of guiding him to Billings. 
And there, for some nebulous motive, possibly back blackmail, but more likely for the mere thrill of the deed, the two participated in his murder. Police state that the pair abandoned Miles' car in Sheridan this afternoon. The dog called Bo eluded the police there, and the assumption is that he has a favorite rendezvous with his master and will head for it. We now return you. Uh, yes, Irish Johnson. He's a hard, cool character. Regular tigress. Why do you say that? Do you know her? No, ma'am. That's just the way I got it figured. This Miles fellow probably played her for a sucker. When she found it out, she hated him enough to want to see him dead. So first she latched on to this fellow, this Sid Latch. <laughs> yeah, she latched on to Latch. And uh, what do you figure he's like, this, uh, this Sid Latch? Him? Well, they say he's an orphan. Kind of uh, discontented war veteran. He hates people naturally, see? Yeah, I see. But I'm not sure I blame him. Anyway, that's how it begins. She makes a bargain with the boy. If he helps her kill Miles, he'll be her lover. I think you're wrong, mister. Ordinary people don't act that way. I've lived a long time, Mr. Wolf. And I've seen a lot of ordinary people. They can sure hate hard when they want to. And what do you suppose happened next? Well, we know that Miles died from a blow on the back of the head. Girl probably crept up on him with this broken end of a bottle they found. But before she could use it, Latch gets a stranglehold on Miles and pounds him to death in this iron stove in the wagon. Now, uh, don't that make sense? I see you're following the case pretty close. <laughs> I'm getting to be an old man. Not much to do around here. Yeah, I follow him. This one's got a big reward that goes with it. Who knows? Maybe Ed Jacobs will collect. Who's Ed Jacobs? Why, that's me, son. Guess I should have introduced myself. Oh, well, I, I wish you luck, Mr. Jacobs. Thanks. All I got to do is keep a sharp watch for a little dog named Bo. Well, I suppose it's lucky for us that we don't own a dog. That's right. The only thing they got to go on is that dog. The other two are a dime a dozen. Why, man could look at you two kids and say you were just what they wanted. But he'd be wrong, Mr. Jacobs. Sure. Sure, I I know that, son. No, now we're just a little tired, Mr. Jacobs. Uh, Maybe I'll leave you be, Mr. Wolf. Enjoy yourselves while you stay. You meet anybody on the street, just break right out and say howdy. That's the kind of folks we are around here. Except when we run up against murderers. We're not quite so friendly then. Not quite. Do you think he suspects anything? I don't know. You can't tell with a windbag. They, they go round and round. I don't know. In tonight's full hour of suspense, Howard Culver stars as Sid in The Search by Grace Amundsen. Tonight's study in suspense. just a moment, we will return with Act Two of Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Which over here, Mac? You won't find anything in that alley except a mess of cash. Oh, I'll just run my bug light through for the heck of it. Meet you at the other end. I reached around blindly for the first doorknob. It turned under my hand. We pushed inside and I shut the door quickly, listening in the darkness to Mac's feet coming slowly toward us. He was nearing us, trying all the doorknobs as he came. I braced my feet on the floor, put my back against the door, and threw my hands out against the narrow walls for support. 
And then the knob turned. Mac rammed his weight against the door to test it. I bunched up every muscle in my body and pressed back. Yeah, don't lock on this one. Must be nailed up. That's hmm. funny. I'd have sworn this was Copper Pete's bag. Oh, he's gone. Oh, I know. safe. Safe, are you? Ah! Who are you? Who are you is more than the point. Now, wait a minute now. Get some light in here, see who I'm talking to. Yeah, it's been a what? Well, a boy, a girl, and a dog. We, we thought this was a restaurant. Yeah. Oh, you in the habit of coming into restaurants by the back door? Yeah. That's the way we do it. See? Well, this is Copper Pete's bar, and I'm Copper Pete. Now, who are you? Mr. and Mrs. Phil Wolf. Howdy. Hello. Hello. Your dog looks hungry. He could be. I think I got a box of Faye's cereal here someplace. Yeah, let's see. There, here it is. Radio says it's only cereal with double flavor. I'll fix it up for you, dog. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, not at all. Not at all. Uh, you two listen to the radio very much? No, we don't. Uh, too bad. Lots of interesting things come over there. Such as what? Oh, music, commercials, news items. You can keep right up with the times. We don't like the times. <laughs> don't blame you. You've been on the move, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that ain't what it used to be. Time was in this country when a man could get out of the way. Made no frontiers anymore. All a man can do now is sit in one spot and listen to the radio. Well, but you don't care for that, do you? No, like I told you. <laughs> Radio's all over these days, just like the law. Me, I'm for the wildcat. I used to be a wildcat myself. Company beat me out. Ain't no day for wildcatters anymore. Radio beats them out. You two hunting in space for the night? Yeah. We are. Yeah. Tell you what. Take the same door out, she come in. Down the end of the alley, there's a flight of back steps. Try them. Ask for Edie. Edie's a wildcatter from way back. You'll get a room there. You see, the town's full up on account of this guy what got erased miles somewhere. Never heard of him. No, of course you ain't. That's because you don't listen to the radio. Why don't we try? Might be some more news about that fellow. When Mrs. Miles issued a shocking statement. Dora Miles told newspaper men that she had been living and praying for years that something like this might happen to her husband. It was only a miracle, Mrs. Miles screamed, that she hadn't murdered him herself. The physician attending Mrs. Miles stressed the fact that she is suffering from hysteria and that no importance can be attached to her statement at this time. Radio. Quite an institution. Hey, I thought you two were gone already. What are you waiting for? I can't make up my mind. About what? I... I wish I knew if I could trust you. No way of knowing, son. Just have to take a chance. All right, Pete. I think I will. Yeah? Evening. Uh... Copper Pete told us to come up here. Come on in. Just the two of you? That's right. And the dog's with us. There's some dog. We'll keep him out of the way. He, he's a quiet dog. That's a quiet girl, too. My wife. How do you do? How do you do? So you two are on the lamb, huh? We'd just like a room if you're not filled up. 
You must have been having a rough time, son, snapping at people that way. We're just like a room, nothing else. I see. Please forgive us, Mrs... Mrs... The name's Edie. We've been traveling all day and we're terribly tired. Yeah. I see that, too. Yeah, it's some dog. We always take Jack with us when we travel. Yeah. You know what? Black and white dogs get to looking like old dust mops. That's what. Hm. So, uh, Copper Pete sent you. He said you'd have a room. Hm. Take the one at the top of the stairs. The best to your left. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Edie. Wait a minute. Uh, yeah? You'll find a box of henna in the medicine chest. Do something about that dog. Yeah. I will. Thanks again. I locked the door behind us and threw Bo into the bathtub. And when I pulled him out again, he was dyed a dull mahogany red. We'd never be recognized by having a black and white dog with us anymore. But there was one more thing to be done before we were safe. One last thing. I put Bo in a corner and went to the opposite side of the room, and then I began calling him to me. Come here, Bo. <laughs> What are you doing? Giving Bo a lesson. Taking his name away from him. Come on, Bo. Oh, Steve, do you have to? Yes, I have to. Come here, Bo. Oh. Bo, you got to learn this if it's the last thing we both do. Come here, Bo. Come It went on for half an hour. Me calling his name and Bo coming over to be cuffed. At last the lesson dawned on him. And when I called him after that, he just sat there looking at me and, and not moving. So, Bo had lost his color and his name. And it looked as though we might make out all right. Open a window, Sid. It's awful close in here. Oh, sure. Sure. Hear that, Iris? Freight train. Yeah. I hear it. We'll be on one tomorrow. We'll be away from here. Away from the manhunt. Oh, Sid, what good is it? What good is it when you have to keep running? When you're afraid of every man you pass in the street and of every hotel you have to stop in at night? We're not going to run forever. I told you what we're going to do. Oh, it gets so lonely, Sid. Lonely? <laughs> I've been lonely all my life. You get used to it after a while. Do you? No. Oh, that was a lie. You never get used to it, Iris. Never. I want to tell you something, Sid. If you don't believe me, I won't blame you. I can't expect you to. Not a girl like me. All right. Tell me. I want to tell you, Sid, that I love you. Iris, when this is all over and we're both free again, will you marry me? Oh, Sid. Oh, oh no, don't cry, Iris. Oh, Sid. It's not because I'm unhappy. Oh, Sid, darling. Now, look, I... I got $5,000 in my old sock here. Every cent I've ever saved. And that's going to be our start. Maybe we could go south. We can have our own home and our, our own land. How can you be sure? Be sure that you want me. How can you be sure? Because I started hating Miles when I first saw you. When I thought you were his girl. 
Because... Because I was glad when he died in the wagon. Even though it meant we were under suspicion and had to run for it. I was glad because we'd be running together. Oh. Oh, now, now don't worry about it, Iris. I am sure. <laughs> dawn, we scribbled a note of thanks to that great lady, Edie. I pinned a five-dollar bill to it. Then we slipped quietly downstairs and stood a minute in the hallway, looking out at the gray, angry sky. It's beginning to rain, Sid. It's all the better. There'd be less people around. Do you want me to walk with you? No, no. Now, look, I'll go ahead with Bo. You follow a few blocks behind I'll toss Bo into a southbound freight at the yards and give you the high sign to come ahead when it looks like she's ready to roll. Oh, I wish we could have seen Edie in person to thank her. Well, maybe we will, Iris. Someday. All right, then. You go first. Right. I'll see you in a few minutes. Bo and I tramped toward the freight yards. Every once in a while, I look back over my shoulder to see Iris coming slowly far behind us produce truck rumbled down the alley ahead of us, and a paper boy with a few wet sheets under his poncho fell into step beside me. The truck stopped up ahead, and the driver got out to unload. I just happened to glance at Bo, and my heart jumped up into my mouth at what I saw. The paper boy would see it, and he missed... Paper, mister? Not today. Come on, be a big shot. All right, here. A whole quarter. Gee, thanks. That's a bribe. Not disappear. Oh, it's a pleasure. Hey, wait a minute. Your dog's bleeding. He always does that. Now scram. No, he ain't bleeding. But what's that stuff running off of him? Funny thing, I ain't never seen that dog around here before. Hey, mister. Be quiet, can't you? But that ain't no red dog. That's a... That's a black and white dog. The truck driver was staring. But now he began moving toward us. I turned in sudden panic and began to run, bow streaking along at my side. As I got near Iris, her white face staring at us in bewilderment, I motioned for her to turn and run, too. We clattered down the alley, doubled around the block to Copper Pete's, burst through his back door, stood inside, breathing hard, listening to the sound of men's racing feet go by the door and fade in the distance. So now we were back where we started from, and freedom was as far away from us as ever. Well, hello again, you three. See, you didn't make it. Oh, some kid recognized Bo. Yeah, that's the way it is with kids. Nothing gets by them. Well, I, I guess there's nothing else to do. Iris. What's it? We'll have to take our chances with a mob. We'll give ourselves up. No. Oh, no, Sid, no. They'll kill us. You, uh, you still got a chance. It's your last one. What's that? Well, there's a drugstore around the corner. It'll open up in about an hour. And? Just walk in and buy some chloroform. What for? I, I know how it is, son. You promised him no life for Riley. But you do like I say. You kill that dog and kill him quick. With him around your neck, you got a one-way ticket to the grave. Not a chance. I'm just telling you the one way of keeping him alive, son. We could be on our way south, Sid. By nightfall. No. Not a chance. An hour later to the second, the door to the drugstore opened, and I moved in out of the rain first customer of the day. The druggist looked at me sharp-like. Guess he didn't often have business that early in the morning. I just stood there looking at him. It seemed like minutes, and then I finally got my mouth open. I want some chloroform. Chloroform? What for? Well, I... You have to know why? Afraid so. It's the law. Law? That's right. I want to get rid of, rid of an animal. What kind of an animal? 
A rat. A big rat. Well, now, you don't bait rats with chloroform. I thought there was something funny. Well, what do you use? Simple. What you're after is rat poison. Yeah. Well, I guess that'll do it. Believe me, sir. It'll do it all right. <laughs> Get it, son? Yeah. Well, the sooner the better. Maybe you want me to do it for you, huh? No, no. No, I'll do it. Rat poison, huh? Well, that's good and strong. Want some ground meat to mix it with? No. Okay. You give it to him straight, huh? I don't know. Oh, let him do it, Sid, please. No, no, if, if I've got to. I'll do it. And you, Iris, you gonna let him kill that dog? Oh, what can I do? We've got our own lives to think of. Well, I was just asking, Iris, just wondering. While you figure this out, son, we might as well see what's going on in the world. Estimate Great little invention here, radio. $1, and now an item of national interest. Stephen Wall, personal physician to the late Roger Miles flew to Pierre from Hollywood late last night to be present this morning at the autopsy. The autopsy revealed that Miles was not killed from a blow on the head, as had been previously I believed. See. That wound on his head was caused when Miles fell to the floor, and in falling, struck his head against an iron stove. The actual cause of death was discovered in Miles' bloodstream, where, together with high al alcohol content, traces of arsenic were found. Well, I'll be... The police, checking on all drugstores in the 100-mile area found that poison had been sold on the morning of the murder to... Why'd you turn it off? They were about to How tell much us... point in hearing it? The police will be here any minute. The police? Yeah. When you went over to the drugstore, I excused myself from Miss Iris, went upstairs and called them. <laughs> and I took my chance on trusting you. you. Can't trust anybody in this world. Did you found that out yet? We're both much beholden to you for the lesson. Well, you see, early this morning, while you two were fast asleep, Edie and I paid a visit to your room. Sid, we can't just stand here. Why don't we run for Wait it? a minute. I want to hear him talk. I'll take care of him when it's finished. And in the course of our visit, we looked through your things. Now, you, son, you're carrying a wad of five grand wrapped in an old sock, ain't you? Keep talking, Pete. It's going to be your last speech. And you, sis, you're carrying a wad of seven grand. And a little bottle that's marked danger, poison. Oh. Ain't you? Iris. Sid! Said the man's raving. He's afraid of you. They claim Miles had a roll on him, maybe several thousand dollars, but they couldn't find him. I tell you, this man is insane. They're darling. And I went out of the wagon for about an hour that night. He was drinking hard. He was drunk. You could have put poison into his bottle. Sid, I love you. You know I do. Stop it. Stop it. Did you kill him? Did you? Sid, how can you ask me that? How could I kill him? He was taking me away. Away from that horrible town. He said he married You already knew he was married. He loved me. He said he did. Why should I kill him? You're lying, lying. When he picked you up that morning, he hardly knew you and you hated him. I saw that. It was the money, wasn't it? You found out about the money. That's what you wanted, wasn't it? Sid. You've got to listen to me. It was the money. And when were you planning to kill me for mine? <laughs> Not until I'd gotten you away from here, gotten you out of danger, huh? Then you'd have done it to me the same way. Ain't that right? Well, why don't you say something, Iris? Well, that'd be the constable. Well, Iris. Okay. So now you know. Just a minute, I'm coming. Pete. Yeah? Pete, if you don't mind. What is it, sis? I'd rather go out to them. All right, sis. Whatever you like. Goodbye, Sid. Thanks for the buggy ride. It was nice being married to you for a while. I could drink, son. No. What are you going to do now? Take my dog and go home. 
round up my flock, go back to work. Yeah. You got to forget her, boy. You know that, don't you? Yeah. I know. Women. I tell you, son, women make the best doggone wildcatters of us all. Our thanks to Howard Culver, who played Sid, and to Sandra Gare as Iris for their excellent performances. The Search by Grace Amundsen was produced and directed by Anton M. Leder. Lud Gluskin is our musical conductor and director. Listen again next week to radio's outstanding theater of thrills, one hour of... Suspense! This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.